everyone welcome and thank you for joining us today uh, today we are pleased to have rick donnelly from united states rick welcome to the university of toronto all the virtually we are excited to have you with us today rick is an and technical fellow at wsp in united states based in new mexico His 36-year career has been devoted to designing, building, and defending regional travel forecasting models and applying them to transport mega projects. He helped found the Transims initiative as at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and later directed Oregon's travel and land use model integration program, one of the first uses of activity-based models at the statewide and regional levels. He has since focused on activity-based travel models at the urban and statewide levels in North America and Australia. More recently. He designed the transport and regional economic simulation of Ontario, used by MTO, updates to their Greater Golden Horseshoe model, and independent reviews of Bay Rail forecasts. His current uh, research interests include applications of machine learning for decision making and rethinking how uncertainty in forecasts are communicated. Rick holds a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Melbourne and is an active member of the Transportation Research Board. Welcome again, Rick. And the floor is all yours. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I got an invitation from Matt Rorta to speak to his students. And at the time, WSP was going through transition from one digital security consultant to another, and a lot of my email wound up in the, the um, spam bucket. And you're supposed to check this like every week, and I would usually check it about once every twenty years. And so, as a consequence, I didn't realize until a lot of people started complaining that I was ignoring their email, um, which I'm famous for. Um, and so, I started looking at you know, where does email go, and I, and I found this, and I was so embarrassed. You know, I, I couldn't even tell Matt what had happened to this thing. But I thought, well, if he ever makes a mistake of inviting me again, I'm not going to screw it up. So here I am. So, um, with that, a um, couple of disclaimers. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is my opinion only, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the views or um, the, the the ideas of my employer, my colleagues at work, um, or my clients, or my dive buddies. In fact, some of them um, view of what I'm going to tell you as heretical. Um, secondly, let me ask you to pose questions in the chat box, and I, I'll leave it to our, our moderator figure out you know, when, when to pose questions. I don't mind asking them during the presentation, um, but if it can wait till the end, please do. So on to the show. So like most of you, I, I tired of slide after slide of just text and bullet points and, and PowerPoint. So I try to use only illustrations of mine and we'll see how that works. So this is kind of my career transformed into data. Um, as you can see that I started out, you know, kind of went from high to low and I get these great ideas and then they didn't work out and things like that. And after a while you, you kind of matured and everything. Um, but I really got my break um, professionally as it were in 1994, um, when I followed Bill Davidson, um, one of the true titans in the field of travel forecasting, uh, at least on the practitioner side, um, to a company called Parsons Brinkerhoff, Quaid and Douglas. And one of the top guys there had decided that they wanted to fill up forecasting expertise in house after a couple of their really big mega projects almost went sneakers up because of problems with or delays in the travel forecast. And so they wanted to pull together the best and the brightest they could. And so they put together what they called the stream team plus one. Um, and I, to be, Honest, I was not part of the dream team. I was the plus one, um, the bench warmer. Um, but by riding along with them, um, I, I've got to do some immense things in my profession. And I've done it all and seen it all in a way that a lot of people really haven't had the opportunity to do so. And that, of course, has shaped um, some of my thinking or warped it, depending on who you talk to, um, about where we should be headed with respect to a lot of these models and what we do about these things. Um, you can see on the bottom there that um, a couple of projects that um, Yusman mentioned, you know, have kind of shaped where I'm at most recently doing 
a lot of work there. And I'm most interested in these two topics of scenario thinking and AI and how that's going to transform things. And that goes on and defines what we're doing. So in school, you learn about travel models as mathematical structures. When people ask me what I do, um, this is what I tell them. It says I, I build artificial societies from snapshots of real world populations to study how policies and investments um, might morph our social activities and travel behavior and that their impact on the social system. And I do it in kind of a controlled um, computer laboratory setting. And if you do this explanation to someone on an airplane, the combined effects of the explanation, alcohol and altitude will ensure that you'll have a peaceful ride the rest of the way without being disturbed. And, but seriously, if, if, you, if you just break this down, I'm doing simulation, which you're familiar with, and my snapshots are primarily um, travel survey data, but also big data. And I'm looking at policies and investments, whether they'll fail or succeed in the future, and doing that through the lens of looking at how activities at, and travel patterns might change as a consequence of those big investments. And so I, I'm far more on the application end of this um, that, than on the model building end. And indeed, when I first started out with PBQ&D, in the 20th century, we primarily addressed only really big questions that you could afford to spin up a mainframe computer to study. But between the microcomputer revolution and advances in the field, the number of uses of these models in public policy making has exploded beyond probably what many of you suspect um, from your work to date. And it's, and it's continuing to balloon into you know, all kinds of different things. Um, the models that we build in practice kind of look like this. There are many different flavors of activity-based modeling, which is what I've primarily been involved with. Um, you're probably more familiar with Tasha than you are with some of the models that we use in the States, but they all kind of drill down to this basic six um, blocks here where we synthesize a population, which I'll talk about in a minute, and we need to do some long-term choices. And as we move to the right, we, we progressively get to faster changing choices um, where we generate tours and activities and we schedule them through the day. And then we put them on a network model to evaluate what's going on. And when we do this in the future, of course, it's massively congested. So we do replanning and we have many opportunities to do that. And of course, to every one of these boxes is pretty detailed um, unto itself. So if I unpack the tour scheduling box, for example, I'm looking at um, the type of tours I'm making and, and how I'm going to schedule them through time and mode. And where am I, how many stops am I going to make on my tour? And where am I going to do it? And um, how might I use a different mode when I'm there and everything? And more recently, we started thinking about how we need to make these models more sensitive to how behavior is changing rapidly over time. Because when we built these models originally, we had the luxury of very slow changing social behavior and travel preferences. And in today's world, it's changing pretty fast as technology and social changes um, move faster than these models do in terms of updating. Each of these models, as you, I, I'm sure, have already seen, are pretty rich with respect to the number of variables that we're able to include. And for generation, for example, you can see five steps that we use up here at the top. And we use a variety of variables to define some of this travel. And we do kind of the same thing with destination choice um, through, through a different process. And I'm not going to bore you with you know, how we develop these models um, because you probably get a better job from Eric and Matt and some of the others up there than I have time to go through this morning. Um, but as sophisticated as these models are, so are their underlying implementations. Um, we start when we think about different types of models that we need to build, and they're kind of defined by the markets that we need to analyze and the performance measures that we need to compile for them. Um, my aforementioned good friend and mentor, Bill Davidson, says that travel forecasting is all about 
markets and deltas. And so it's, it's these things that you see on this top row here that kind of define what we're doing. And there are many different modeling approaches that we can use. One of them that you see there, machine learning, is kind of my current big interest. Um, but once we define the, the modeling approach, uh, we use a combination of agents and inanimate objects to describe these. And they each have properties, of course, that, that we need to codify, um, which makes the implementation side of this thing at least as challenging um, and requiring as close a thought as it does to build these models in the first place. But when we get done with these things, we have a synthetic population, and it looks like a subset of the census, mi census microdata, uh, which, of course, it is because we build it from that. Except that instead of a sample, we're building this synthetic population for the entire um, study area. So for each household, we have a person, we have person attributes, and we're able to carry this information further along. So we build travel records um, that look I like the travel diary, like your transportation tomorrow survey or TTS, and it includes a lot of information about trips and tours, and origin, destination, my mode, my departure time, and things of that nature. And again, instead of a small sample of the population that we have in the TTS, um, we're in essence, in our models, we're generating a synthetic travel diary for the entire population. And then we take these things and we test them with network models. Now, building these models is fun, and it is cool and challenging. But doing so is not really the point in my world. Um, the, the point is, how can I use these things to inform policymaking? And this is driven home in what we call the Davidson diagram, where Bill would say that the whole point of travel forecasting is to tell a story, the leftmost box here on the screen. At some point, we want to use these models to inform public policy. And to do that, we need to tell it in a way that makes sense to policymakers and in metrics they understand. And once you know the story you want to tell, that should dictate the type of forecast that you want to build in order to, in, to tell that story, which in turn should dictate the model that you're going to use, um, because there's not a one-size-fit-all model, which in turn would dictate the platform. And in this view, kind of the focus turns from like the conceptual elegance and and sophistication of the models, the how well the model matches current reality to more of um, how robust and relevant and appropriately responsive are these models when you use them in forecasting. And as hard as it is to craft these models, some of our biggest challenges lie outside of the model box, which is interesting because in the past 20 years or so, we've really focused heavily on models, almost to the exclusion of everything else. And if you look at the literature on activity-based modeling, for example, you'll find that all of it is about models and very small sliver of it is about, how did I use it in applications? How did I make better decisions as a result of doing so? How best to use it? Things like that, we just haven't even focused. And this would be fine, I guess. Um, if I could now expand these other boxes so that they're once again the same size and we return balance to the system. But the reality is that these things are so expensive to build that I don't really have the budget or the time to do so. But policy analyses and project evaluations are you know, pretty fast moving animals in a very fluid political environment. And, 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 and so, these two boxes over here th that are pretty small to forecasting, there's big concern when, when these things get out into the wild as what's inside the box. Now, some people posit that if I build a brilliant enough model and it's sophisticated enough that any competent and capable modeler should be able to use this um, in order to evaluate anything that's thrown at them. Maybe, um, yeah, no, probably not. Um, because the world is not 
an instance of the model, but rather the other way around. And that world is changing pretty fast for us. And so as a consequence, um, even if I have a great model, it often falls down for us in practice. So Ben Fleberg from Oxford um, 20 years ago did a comprehensive study of mega projects and he looked at how the forecasts fail when we look at these things. And he found, as I think I found in my profession to date, that errors about assumptions in the inputs, particularly the land use changes and the big pivotal ones like signature land redevelopment projects or um, urban redevelopment um, initiatives, they're the biggest, not getting those right are the biggest cause of errors. And the second biggest thing is that because we're using a small sample of origin destination data from our travel surveys, that there's a lot in there that we're missing. And some of those come back to bite us when we're looking at areas that weren't really real well covered in our survey. But these two things kind of dwarf all other errors combined, including misspecification of the models, not having an elegant enough model, um, not being appropriately responsive enough, et cetera. And then not really thought about until recently is like, well, how much error are in these models? Because we assume that tomorrow is going to be like today when in fact it's really not. So to show you a couple of examples of kind of the scale of the problem, um, here's some forecasts. The ones on the left are from a TRB report that looked at how travel forecasts prepared in 1980 looked when you compared it against the reality in their forecast horizon of 22,000. And as you can see in Atlanta, um, they grew a lot less than they thought they would, and both population and employment. Where Chicago, um, it, it didn't grow as much in employment, but it really grew in, in population and so on and so forth. And you can see that there's a sort of a pattern of underestimating um, employment and kind of a mixed bag with respect to population and employment. And this is region-wide. When you get down to very specific areas within these regions, sometimes you have very substantial errors that would influence some of your project evaluations. And more recently, I've tried to pull together some um, you know, comparable data from my forecast that I pulled together, Melbourne and Oahu, uh, um, over that time, same time frame, looks about kind of the same, surprisingly close to Portland, Oregon, in fact, and I want to do the same thing for the GTHA. And I, I keep wanting to, to um, get together with Sundar at MTO and chase down this data, but I haven't really done it. Um, but this really points out that even if I had a perfect model, um, no error in it at all, um, it wouldn't solve my problem or, or this particular problem. And moreover, I've, I've got other problems that I need to look at that um, I could afford to abstract out in the past. And one of those is changes in the vehicle fleet. In you know, 2010 or so, everything driving down the road was an internal combustion engine in it. Now, there were a couple of hybrids, um, but mostly everything was internal combustion engine. Today, um, we see a lot of trips being made by mobility services, but it's still a minority. Um, when I prepared this graph, I thought that maybe up to 3% of some of the battery electric vehicles out there might be on fully automated. And I think we're close, but we're not there. Um, but as you can see, as I look into the future, I expect the internal combustion engine to um, lose its dominance and eventually be overtaken by you know, a, a quite different fleet than I have today, which might be used in different sort of ways. And I hasten to point out that this is not what's going to happen. This is only one plausible explanation that can happen. You, of course, could all get together and come up with a different set of um, outcomes you know, over time. But the point is, no one really believes that we're going to be um, stuck with today's technology far into the future. You could make that assumption in 1980, um, and you'd be totally right by the turn of the century, um, but no longer so. Even more relevant to today is kind of telecommuting trends over time. 
Um, Dave Levinson, who was then at the University of Minnesota and now at the University of Sydney, has probably the best time series data on telecommuting um, in existence. And he looked at 1990, 2000, and 2010. Unfortunately, his data series doesn't extend to the current day. Um, but even before the pandemic, you can see that in both single worker and multi worker households, that we were already starting to move the needle quite significantly with respect to the number of people that would work from home one or more days a week. And over there on the right-hand panel, you can see data from that I've tried to pull together from some COVID impact surveys, which shows almost a reversal of what we saw in the past. So when you think about the future, I don't think anybody expects it to look like 2020, you know, indefinitely, but we're also not going back to 1990. In fact, if Dave Levinson had created a forecast in 1990 um, of 2010, you can see here dramatically how far off he would have been, even if he had a great model, um, just because of his inability to, to deal with this. Um, so when I look at models, I, I say, well, this increase in sophistication that we brought upon us and these better models um, have brought some both internal and external effects with them that I need to figure out how to work through. Um, on the internal side, you know, of course, we've built more complex and complicated models that have a bigger computational footprint and generate a lot more data. It's a lot harder to pick out signal from the noise or even misinterpreting noise um, as signal and a large number of parameters and so on and so forth. But if you ask a travel modeler today, say, well, what's your biggest constraint? They're going to tell you, well, I lack data or I lack time or I lack the budget um, in order to do a better job. And that's certainly probably true. But, you know, out there, um, we also have some externalities that, that we need to pay attention to. One is that um, we no longer live in a society where they have a certain, reasonably certain view of the future. Um, we're overwhelmed with uncertainty, both about the inputs to the model as well, well as some of the parameter estimates with, within them and what their, some of their ranges are and how they work together. But almost all of the policymakers that I work with now, um, they view a travel forecast as a high risk sort of um, analytic because they are convinced that the future is not going to look like today. And that if we build a model that just builds on that one you know, consensus view of the future, it's probably going to be wrong um, in this age of accelerating change. And I list here one of the externalities being ransomware. That really doesn't affect our models, and I don't pretend that it does. The reason I list it here is because it has terrified corporations and governments such that they've really locked down our computer systems. So it makes it hard to do a lot of innovative work where... I, I'm building models and constantly downloading stuff from GitHub and I'm sharing data. Um, instead, it has kind of caused us to, to lock down our data and our computer systems that, that make um, innovation a little bit more difficult to engineer nowadays. And all of this together has kind of made a lot of my policymaker friends thinking, well, no, the problem is not so much that you guys don't have budget. The lack is that um, some of your tools and the way you approach these problems, they can't evolve fast enough in order to meet some of the demands that, you know, we have bearing down upon us. So I go back to the Davidson diagram and I look at it and I realize, well, you know, I, I can associate my internal problems with my right two boxes and my external problems with the left two boxes but it convinces me that there is no one size fits all solution. You know, I, I need to somehow, I need to, to be able to plumb up and run models faster um, and in a more automated way on the right hand side. But I also need to change kind of how I use these models on the left hand side. Um, and when I had this big thing where the model is so much larger than these other boxes. I couldn't really consider more than one future. I couldn't afford to. Um, and in the last century, that was okay because we typically thought of the future as a more prosperous, more crowded, and necessarily more congested sort of place that was a clone of today. 
But nobody really believes that anymore. And I can't get enough legislators, policymakers, and investment bankers to buy that anymore. Um, so the, the one crossover here for us has been that the age of the forecast is over. And probably the age of the single uh, model is as well. So what does the future look like? Um, it's probably best illustrated in this one figure from a thesis that was published this year by a guy at the University of Sydney. And he's talking about ensemble planning. And we'll, we'll talk about the lower rows on this. But of course, what we're doing right now is on the top row, where we have a single set of assumptions and data that inform a single model that come up with a single forecast in the future. And we test variations of that single forecast in the future um, with different types of infrastructure projects or maybe different policies, but it's basically that one future. And the problem is that I can't move out of that one top row because each of those boxes are pretty expensive. So I need an approach I can leverage um, the same data that I'm using and some of the same methods, but being smarter and faster about it. So machine learning seemed natural to me as a way of doing that. So when I talk to people about machine learning, they, 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 uh, a lot of people um, throw up their hands and they say, well, you know, it's just confusing blizzard of techniques and acronyms that um, you don't even know where to start in something like this. Um, and there are a lot of approaches out there, not a lot of which we need to worry about in order to make progress. But it helps to understand that really what machine learning is under the hood is logistic regression models and classification models that we're both really familiar with um, all the time. And in a sense, it's not the tools that are changing. It's the fact that instead, we're automating this in a structural way in, in, in machine learning and cutting the human out of the loop. And that's a bit disconcerting for a lot of people. Um, machine learning, of course, is one part of AI, and there's a lot of AI anxiety out there. And Kai-Fu Lee wrote a great book that you should read if you haven't already called AI Superpowers. Um, it should be the next thing you read, in fact, although maybe you should wait till after exams. But the point that he makes in there is that the AI revolution, like a lot of technical revolutions, it kind of moves along where it's in academia and, and we're doing kind of toy things and it looks kind of fragile and, you know, not very impressive. And we expect that things will gradually get better. But in fact, what happens is it gets a lot better very fast. And we're, we're often not used um, to that type of rapid uptake. And we're not really prepared to stitch it into our way of doing business. Deep learning. Um, one of these waves that I'm interested in requires four things that you see there in the middle panel. Um, a lot of data, some strong algorithms, pretty narrow focus, and some pretty concrete goals. And we have three or four of those in transport modeling. We don't really have a massive amount of data, although we've tried to backfill with big data. And he argues that really in order to be impactful, um, this has got to get out of the laboratory and into practice. So I'm trying to do my part. Um, but he also makes the point that AI is not going to replace our jobs. Um, and it's not going to take over engineering as we know it today. Rather, it's going to reshape it and it's going to extend it in ways that we don't right now know how best to, to leverage. But, you know, in order to succeed in the future, I didn't have to do this, but you are all going to have to be able to leverage AI in order to build better designs and um, better analyses to inform policymaking that are based on goals and um, trade-offs that society is going to make. And to really succeed in engineering, um, that's kind of what you're going to be doing. When we use it in practice, um, it's really kind of simple. And it's not a lot different than building a model that we use right now. I start out with my use case on the left-hand side of this diagram, and then I pull together the data that I'm going to use. And 
in the past, I'd partition my data into training data and testing data. Um, because we can use cross-validation and machine learning, I can combine the two data. But the point is, I'm going to pull together the data. I'm going to have the machine train it on it. And it's going to build a prediction engine, which is truly a black box because it builds a binary stack that we can't reduce back out to an equation that we're used to looking at. But then I can use that model to, to do prediction. And as I think more about um, the type of predictions that I'm getting out of it, it might shape my kind of the questions I'm posing to it, which might influence the data and, and so forth. And I have this flywheel effect of how my models will evolve over, over time as my thinking does. I want to call your attention to those numbers across the boxes in the middle of all. As with traditional models, the majority of the effort goes into audit, preparing the data that goes into this thing rather than actually doing the models. Um, when, when, I'm, when I'm building these models, they actually come together very fast. And that's one of the big advantages I have for them. So let me show you an example that might make this sort of concrete. One thing that I deal a lot with is inner city mode choice um, because I'm, I've studied a lot of high-speed rail projects and I critiqued and been in court trying to defend forecasts of these things um, a lot in recent times. And if I go the traditional route, I'm going to build a discrete choice model of mode choice. And so I'm going to segment my population by one or more of these variables that you see in here in these two data sets, which are the only two in North America that are, are big enough really to do much with. Um, the NHTS that you see there from 2002, that's the National Highway Household Travel Survey in the US. And you may be familiar with the Travel Survey of Residents of Canada or the TSRC that's available there. That's a much larger data set, but they have about the same variables. So there's some opportunities to, to do some interesting things here. Um, with logic models. So I might do some segmentation. Here, I'll probably do it on trip purpose because that explains a lot of the difference, um, just knowing whether you're on business travel, someone else is paying for it, versus personal travel, um, where I'm paying for it. Um, but then I'm going to build a general additive model um, to, to kind of talk about the utility um, of each of these variables and their contribution to decision making. But it turns out that this particular um, problem, inner city mode choice, is a really a hard one to get right with any kind of model um, because almost everybody travels by auto when they make long distance travel. And error is the second most dominant mode. I mean, if I just, if I just guess, I could guess auto and I'd be right most of the time. Um, so I built a, a logic model and worked with some friends um, who also built one of their own and who was able to, after a couple of months, do some trial and error and stuff like that, pull together a decent model. Um, here's how it did with respect to looking at mode choice. The kind of green shaded box there is what I would consider an acceptable per, uh, error level in predicting modes. It gets auto right as it should, um, but it generally falls down on the other modes. But then I got to thinking, you know, I could just randomly guess at it and I could do almost as well. And more importantly, you know, it's a single line of code um, to just sample from an observed probability distribution and guess at what the mode is. And when I do that, um, I, I'm almost as good as the logic model in terms of, you know, I'm 90% right instead of 95% right or 96% right, but I pretty much miss all the other modes. But, you know, then again, the logic model doesn't do a whole lot better. So I started looking around and saying, well, what kind of machine learning models um, could I use to better understand these data? So the first thing I put this thing through was a decision tree. Um, and I, again, a single line of code. And the model goes through and says, well, if I don't know anything better, I'm going to choose auto. But if I know the distance is greater than 1,200 miles or so, I'm more likely to take error. And then you can see there on the right-hand side in my decision tree, 
all the variables that it considers and all the breakpoints that it uses to come up with a, a choice model that is a lot more accurate than either guessing or a logit model. And I also decided, well, I'm going to put this thing into a neural network, which is a true black box, um, in that I'm going to put all the data in on, on the left-hand side, and I'm going to get mode out on the right-hand side, and it's going to go through uh, a number of hidden layers in the middle to stack up different types of interaction terms that aren't really visible to me. I can see the weights that you can see that I've labeled here on this from one particular run of the model. So I can tell which ones are, are probably more significant, some interactions that the model finds. But by and large, um, the upside of this model is that it's very good at prediction. The downside is I have no idea why it is very good at prediction. And that's disconcerting for a few people. And well, I'll come back to that in a minute. So when I tried a, a, diff, a lot of different approaches, um, I got some interesting results. Again, um, on these table, the green cells are the ones that are what I call a, an acceptable error level, and the ones in white are, are probably not. And we've tried a lot of different things in looking at this data set. I've tried fusing the two surveys in different ways, weighting them in different ways. We've tried um, undersampling. Uh, where we remove samples from the overrepresented class, which would be auto in this case. And we try to oversampling or include um, more samples from the underrepresented categories. And we use an automated process called SMOTE or synthetic minority oversampling um, technique. And we also developed something that we call CEDO or the successive elimination of dominant outcomes. And when I stack all these models up against one another, um, as you can see on the right there, this successive elimination of dominant outcomes plus randomly choosing the really infrequent ones um, had the lowest amount of error and the highest predictive accuracy of any approach, followed by over and under sampling using a neural net and everything else kind of arrays down below it. And the, the CEDO that we came up with is to say, well, let's do a multi-stage model instead of a single throw it all in there, let it grind through it, and dump out the end. That way, we can at least understand what it's doing. So I start out and I say, well, look at all the response proportions for whatever variable I'm trying to measure, which in this case is mode of travel. And I says, is there a dominant response in there? That's my first decision box. And I say, well, yes, there is auto. So I classify um, for auto versus all the other categories. And I build a model and I store it out somewhere. And then I eliminate all the auto from my choice set, my training data. And then I go back and I do it again. And I say, hmm, now for the, all the remaining modes, is there a dominant choice? Well, yeah, it turns out air is. Okay, so I'll classify air versus everybody else. And I'll go through the same step and I'll build a model and I'll store it. And then I come back through again and I say, after taking the auto and air out, do I still have a dominant mode? I said, no, not really. So then I can classify everybody else and I can be done with it. And what this looks like in reality um, is something like this. If I know nothing at all, I'd say, well, I'm going to take auto. But if the distance is greater than about 800 miles, I'm going to segment it into auto versus non-auto. And then for those people that aren't traveling by auto, um, I say it, air versus non-air is the next dominant mode. It says, well, I'm mostly going to not take air, but if the distance is greater than about 500 miles, I am going to take air. And you can see that then it goes down and it looks at the remaining modes. And I eventually get down to the bottom of predicting bus versus everybody else. And when I implement this model um, in practice, it kind of looks like this. Um, I was, I'm generating journeys um, from an observed data set. And 
that I'm going through and I'm choosing a primary destination for them based on the frequency of arrivals. I have my Logit model, and then I have the two machine learning models that I also run at the same time, and then I do a polling to see are all three models giving me the same answer? If not, are two of them giving me the same answer? And how far off is the third one? And and if not, if I'm getting all three giving me um, a different answer, then I have a different choice to make um, about this thing. And then I finally go and do a journey routing. So this model that we use in practice, the most compelling thing about it is not that the ML approaches are more accurate, um, because the two boxes there, the CEDO and the, and the neural net, usually agree with one another. Um, but that the logit model, the one in the middle there, it took months to develop and a lot of human trial and error to settle on a model that performs great. And the three blue boxes that you see there, the um, machine learning, they fell together in a single afternoon. So I, I, I really can scale these things. So for machine learning, I think um, it's great, great potential. It's not a panacea. Um, both men and machines have kind of their blind spots and, and their limitations. And the challenge is how can we use these things together in order to better understand um, the behavior that we're looking at and come up with more resilient forecasts? So that's one path to the multiple models. How do I get multiple futures? Well, there's an approach called scenario thinking that was developed by, of all people, Shell Oil, um, that seeks to tell stories about possible futures. So stories, remember, is that leftmost box in the di Davidson diagram. And they're not forecasts per se, but they're an invitation for us to think more rigorously about what the future might look like and how that might have implications for what we're doing. And really explaining and walking you through scenario thinking is a whole nother presentation all into itself. But let me just illustrate really quickly with an example from another project I'm doing, where we're looking at five main um, vectors of change here, um, contagions, the future of work, the effect of automation and AI, autonomous vehicles and military. And we're, we have a, a bunch of different scenarios under each of them, as you can see that, um, range from fairly dismissive to maybe all in as to what some of these effects are gonna be. Now I could simulate all combinations of these, but I don't really need to because they're not, um, they're, they're, they're not, a lot of them are mutually exclusive or, or they don't travel together. What I can do is find a common thread to them and, and tell a couple of scenarios. Maybe in two or three pages, I can write a narrative that describes what that future might look like and what some of its implications might be for our forecasts that we develop. And so the, the whole point of this isn't to come up with a better forecast, but rather the goal is to um, enable a conversation about different futures that, that might be out there. So it turns out we have a lot writing on this. You know, in 2019, not that long ago, the idea that we um, would consider pandemics in our forecasts um, seem like science fiction and maybe dystopian sci-fi at that. Um, and in 2019, um, we didn't have mention our engineering toolkit to combat peak period congestion in Toronto. Um, even by single digits. And, and those solutions that we did have were stupidly expensive. But if trends continue towards remote more, it might really change the business case for the freeway expansions that we've been doing all these years to accommodate never-ending growth and congestion. So these two things together finally enable me to move to the rows down below this thing. And the, the bottom line is that machine learning and scenario thinking together are the way to start filling these boxes and these circles a lot faster and differently enough that, that we can start looking at um, ensemble planning. So we can look at a range of forecasts and the risks and more um, lucidly talk about uncertainty to policymakers, um, which will make these things a lot more relevant in policymaking. And in so doing, um, it changes the Davidson diagram for me. Um, what 
we will do is in the shaded boxes in the future, I think, and we're going to let AI kind of own the right two boxes, and we're going to focus on the left in, in order to, you know, build what we're doing. And that's, that's kind of where I'm going. Um, and so I see there's some questions. Let's see what's in the chat box. Um, let me see what I can say. What is the box on the Thank left you. cannot read? Yes, I will read it for you. But yeah, thank you, Rick. It was an interesting and very thoughtful presentation. Maybe some of us will get our research uh, research goals. Yeah, I hope so. Um, here's some things I would recommend that you read. Um, I put some links there that, that you can pick them all up. Um, one book by Kahneman, the one in the middle there, is something you find on Amazon. It's really fascinating about how we mistake um, patterns in, uh, of noise for signal, and, and, and we go from there. Um, someone asked about overfitting models. Um, a lot of times when we do our logic models, we tend to try to work on them really hard so that they have the highest fit statistics. And we often introduce a lot of constants and dummy variables into them. In, in order to do so. And in so doing, we get a great fit of a model that might represent reality, but it's not very sensitive to different changes because of the effects of the constants that we have into it. And it's easy to do when we throw all of our data into training and none of it in the, into it. Um, and we use only training accuracy to evaluate our models. Instead, I think we need to be looking a lot more at predictive accuracy of the overall modeling system than, than we do um, right now. All right. Uh, if there are any other questions, please, uh, you could either write your question in the chat and I can read it for you on your behalf, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question.